Okay, welcome to our last session for our first day of the excellent Curve Summit. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've had a lot of great speakers. And we're going to end on a very high note here with Twyla Braze. Um, she'll be talking about individual rights, privacy, and government powers in and after a pandemic. Uh, Twyla is president and co-founder of Citizens Council for Health Freedom, CCHF. Um, that's a national patient-centered organization established more than two, two decades ago in Minnesota to support health care choices. Individualized patient care, sorry, I'm having trouble pronouncing this late in the day, um, and medical and genetic privacy. So this talk will be very much on the intersection of everything you all care about with public health, privacy, and what's going on with COVID-19. So thank you, Twyla, and welcome. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate being invited to talk with you all and at least share our perspective. I am, I can't remember if you said this, I'm a registered nurse, public health nurse, and a co-founder of this organization, and so have been dealing with privacy issues since 1996 when we got an anonymous note and asked to come to a conference committee and that really began all of our work having to do with privacy and so now we're known a lot for that but we also do deal with um, healthcare choices and wanting to make sure that the patient and the doctor can work together in the exam room without outside interference and at an affordable price so um, i i uh, titled it this way because i think one of the most important things that um, people need to know is about what are their individual rights in a pandemic? And um, let me just move here. So yeah, individual rights versus, uh, I mean, emergency powers versus individual rights. And so after 9-11, I don't know if you know the, his, the history of this, but after 9-11, the, uh, the CDC in very short order issued a model emergency health powers act and it was a model state emergency health powers act so it was really something that they wanted states to um, enact in their um, in their own legislatures and so they were pushing this and as it turns out this particular model legislation had been in the works for three years so they were just waiting for an opportune time and after 9 11 happened and then the um, anthrax scare happened and so on october 23rd this report got issued. It was revamped in December of uh, 20, uh, 2001, and then states argued about it in 2002. Uh, let me just make sure what my next slide is here. Right, here we go. So we fought in the state of Minnesota, we fought for individuals to have certain rights and initially what the legislation said was if you did not submit to treatment testing examination the taking of specimens vaccination experimental um, treatments then you could be charged with a misdemeanor so you could become a criminal so we spent four and a half months trying to get and finally successfully getting the right of individuals to refuse to refuse to, um, to to say yes to all of these, although they maintained in the law that if you refuse and they want you to do it, they can put you in quarantine or isolation for the appropriate amount of time until you're proved to be non-infective or not sick. So as you see in this um, PowerPoint slide, it was introduced in nearly 40 states, enacted in whole or in part in 20 states, uh, Minnesota enacted a whole bunch of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, they even took the opportunity to enact a law that, that is 24-7, um, 365 days a year, that the health department can just take you from wherever you are and detain you without a court order for up to 72 hours. We fought really hard against that, and several years later when they were trying to repeal certain sections of the law, we tried really hard to get that part repealed, but were unsuccessful. So we do not know everything that is in every other state, 
but we do know that every state has emergency powers uh, for the governor. The only question is whether you have uh, emergency health powers for the health department. And so to some degree, at least 20 states do. It par that particularly goes, uh, relates to quarantine, isolation, examination, testing, treatment, vaccination, but also it's all about surveillance, tracking, reporting, control of materials. And it's not only control of materials, but control of buildings, control of land, uh, the disposal of dead bodies, the control of healthcare facilities, for instance, the control of healthcare supplies, rationing protocols, all of this was part of the model legislation and you know, the degree to which any state has this just depends on whether they did, they took it on in part or in whole. Okay, so Minnesota law. So I realize when you do a PowerPoint that making this kind of PowerPoint slide is difficult, but since it's a webinar and you're all looking, I know that you can at least um, read part of it and you can see right here this is Minnesota Statute 12.39. And so you can go to the Minnesota uh, statutes and, and just get this language all on its own. We have now, just as of um, this week, put out model state uh, legislation for a variety of issues. And one of them has to do with this. And so you can also go to our website at cchfreedom.org and find the press release uh, we will have it uh, noted somewhere else um, eventually, but right now it's just in the press release section or right there on the home page, and you can get access to that library. But you'll see here that it acknowledges that individuals have a right to refuse all of these things, but it also says those who refuse can be ordered by the commissioner into isolation or quarantine according to these parameters. And these parameters right here have to do with the 24-7 365 days a year, all of the, um, what the courts can do, what the health department can do while you're in quarantine, what the health department has to do while you're in quarantine, all of that sort of thing, your access to the court, your right to appeal, all that kind of deal. And then this, it took us a long time to get this, to notify the individual of the right to refuse. We didn't actually get it in the main session, we got it in the special session that came afterwards. So uh, it was very difficult to fight the health department on this. Okay, now, um, specific to privacy, surveillance, and the current crisis called uh, COVID-19, um, I'm just gonna take a moment here to, to just say that I am investigating a whole bunch of parameters around COVID-19, and am doing about two, one, one to two videos a week, typically about two videos a week, and I just finished our ninth video and COVID-19. So before I get into the surveillance part, I just, it's an opportunity for me to say uh, what doctors are saying, which is how much different COVID-19 is from any other disease that they have ever treated in their entire practice, how they're all trying to figure out exactly what is the uh, physiological mechanism, how they have realized a lot of them, there is some disagreement about this, but for the most part, a lot of doctors are now saying that it's a good thing to keep people off the ventilators and do things like proning, which is to put them on their stomach or uh, using hydroxychloroquine before they ever get to the hospital or using CPAPs and high flow oxygen because these patients are like no patients they've ever seen before with really low oxygen saturation levels, really low. Like one doctor said um, on oxygen, so you're supposed to be at 94 to 100% your blood oxygen level. And um, on oxygen, they could be like 80s, in the 80s, right? But then they take off their mask and their saturation level drops to 20%, just plummets. And, and yet, if they're having their oxygen on, they're very happy. They're texting, they're calling, they're doing many things. They're not having any problem breathing per se. So this is very, very unusual. It's not typical and they're all trying to figure it out. And so it's very fascinating uh, to even watch them try to figure this out. So just know that about COVID-19, very serious, but we're fi figuring out it's not as lethal as people think because um, lethality really has to do with how many people die according to how many people are 
infected, and we don't have that number. We don't have that denominator yet. Okay, so COVID-19 and HIPAA and the lethality of it and the claims about how many people are going to die have really um, helped to push this idea of surveillance. All right, so, um, but the thing I always like to let people know, and we're uh, considered experts in this, is that HIPAA does not protect privacy. And I can just assure you that even Congress, members of Congress don't know this, their staff don't know this because we once visited with them about 22 uh, members or 22 offices and we asked them, what does it mean when you sign that piece of paper in the doctor's office called HIPAA? And they said to a, per to a person, they said, it means that my information is between me and my doctor. But you see, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that at all. It is like the greatest deception foisted on the American uh, public like in forever. So here, here's the basics. Uh, 1996 law, which is HIPAA, and HIPAA stands for, there's no privacy in it, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And there's a section in it called Administrative Simplification, which said that either Congress had, which said that all the data could be made uh, digital and computerized, and said that Congress had to pass a privacy law in three years or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services would be required to do it by rule. Congress naturally did not make all those difficult decisions about taking away people's privacy and they let the department do it. Uh, Secretary Shalala at that time that was under the Clinton administration said in her recommendations to Congress that people have an age-old right to privacy, but they were changing that to be able to make information available for publicly useful purposes. And so the rule came out, it stripped all consent rights for sharing of data away from patients. Uh, there was a great complaint uh, process in the public comments, more than 50,000 uh, complaints about taking away consent. They put consent back in. The Bush administration came in, uh, the health plans approached the Bush administration and said, we need you to open up the rule and take out that consent requirements. And that's what the Bush administration did. And so now HIPAA has no consent requirements, except for things that are really um, minor and have, uh, having to do with minors, um, but not things that you typically think about. So here, it eliminated the consent requirements for data sharing. According to the federal government in a 2010 rule, 2.2 million entities uh, have access. That includes uh, more than 702,000 covered entities. Covered entities are those who are like um, long-term care facilities, hospitals, clinics, laboratories, doctor's offices, data clearing houses, um, all of those kind of folks that you go to or you need for care. So those are called covered entities. And then there's 1.5 million business associates, which include all sorts of other entities like data, lawyers, research, uh, anything else that's not a healthcare uh, facility. Uh, so there's 2.2 million entities, and then that number does not cover all the government agencies that can have access to your data without your consent. One thing I didn't put in here is that your data is available without your consent for 12 national priority purposes. Those include things like um, research, public health, administration, judicial proceedings, law enforcement, organ procurement, uh, and more, um, military, national security. Okay, and then, um, and then for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Now, treatment and payment are more than you think they are, but they're relatively small definitions. Um, but then there's the healthcare operations, which is a nearly 400-word uh, definition, but it's really a list of more than 65 different um, activities, business activities, non-clinical activities. And it is a res as a result of the healthcare operations and the fact that a business associate agreement is required when a covered entity who holds your data chooses to give your data to a business associate or perhaps another covered entity if they want, like if one hospital is asking another hospital to do something with the data. Uh, you have to have a business associate agreement. And so um, Ascension, healthcare system, which is located in 21 different states, shared the medical records of 50 million people with Google, 
uh, using a business associate agreement, which is allowed under healthcare operations. So Google now has the information of um, 50 million people, names, addresses, um, diagnoses, medication, treatment, everything that's in those medical records could even include comments to the doctors. So then we come to COVID-19 and um, you can, all sorts of things are happening here. So one is that the Office for Civil Rights just issued a temporary rule under the COVID-19 crisis and said that all these business associates can share information with the government without the consent of the covered entity with whom they are contracted. So if um, data company X has all the information of hospital B, data company X can share it with the government. They don't have to get, um, they don't have to ask for permission from company B. And, um, but they do have to tell the company within 10 days that they have shared their information with the government. And so this is a temporary rule. We'll see if it gets lifted. Um, then the CARES Act, which is the third coronavirus bill, has three things having to do with privacy or lack thereof in it. The first one of interest is the public health surveillance and analytics infrastructure. That's the words. There's very little description around it. They get 500, um, Congress is giving $500 million uh, appropriating that amount of money to build this thing. And all you have to do is look at the words. So public health means government. Surveillance means tracking and monitoring. Analytics means what they're going to do with our data. And infrastructure means a system. And in this case, because it's Congress, it's a national system. Uh, those who have been proponents of this cheered afterwards. Um, they're a group called HIMSS, H-I-M-S-S. They cheered about it, and they're talking about how it could be used for providing real-time access to the government, obviously through the electronic health record or through the um, health information exchanges or the National Health Information Exchange, which is now called eHealth Exchange. Um, by the way, because I didn't mention it anywhere in this PowerPoint, I think it's good for you to know that in 2009, one month after um, the inauguration of President Obama, a bill was passed called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Within that bill was another act, or within that act was another act, called HITECH, Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, and it mandated electronic health records. They had to be according to government specifications to do what government wanted on penalty of, uh, um, if you don't comply, the penalty is a lower uh, payment for every Medicare patient that you see. And so that's why you have electronic health records in all the doctor's offices, in all the hospitals, is because they were essentially forced to do it um, and there was there was thirty billion dollars, at least thirty billion dollars in that bill, to give some money to start it. But it's a non-funded mandate, and a lot of hospitals, particularly small smaller hospitals, have gone away or been merged into big hospitals because they could not afford the electronic health record mandate. A lot of doctors, the same thing. They've left their independent practice and become employees as a result of this uh, mandate. Okay, and so this infrastructure here can be built there, therefore by real-time access to the electronic health records which are all hooked up to the grid through the state health information exchanges or the e-health exchange, the national version of this. Um, I have written a book about this called uh, Big Brother in the Exam Room, The Dangerous Truth About Electronic Health Records, just talking about the dangers to privacy, to patient safety, and to freedom as a result of this mandate in the um, High Tech Act. All right. So back to the CARES Act, uh, so this is the third coronavirus bill. The, the next thing that it did was for people with substance use and abuse issues, they have had the strongest privacy protections in this country uh, for 30 years at least. And it said that every time their data was shared, they had to give express written consent. Uh, and when they gave, they gave their data to one, shared it with one doctor, one hospital, or you know, one clinic, if that clinic, hospital, or doctor wanted to share it with anybody else, they had to come back and get express written consent for sharing that data. Um, 
Now what the CARES Act does is says for these patients, after the first time they consent to the data, whoever that data goes to can then redisclose it without getting their consent again. So they're a little bit better than HIPAA, which has no consent at all. Um, but a lot of these people are vulnerable and they may not even realize what they're signing and they won't understand that after they've signed once, all that data can be disclosed and redisclosed and redisclosed without ever having come coming back to them. They can stop those disclosures, but they have to figure out that it ever happened and then it's up to them. So it's an opt-out, which is never as protective as an opt-in. All right, and then the third thing is it requires HHS, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, to issue guidance on data sharing under HIPAA. And so what you know about HIPAA now, which you may not have already understood, is that of course, that guidance is going to say that there's all sorts of sharing that can happen. I think the one thing that I forgot to say about HIPAA that I should say is there are only two required shares in HIPAA. One of them is with the patient themselves, and the other is with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in their enforcement of compliance with HIPAA. But HIPAA is considered a permissive data sharing law or rule. And so all of this data can be shared by all of these entities with all of these entities without patient consent. It's permissive. They don't have to, but they can. So all of this data sharing is happening behind the scenes and uh, patients have no idea that it's happening. Okay, so then the advanced surveillance under COVID-19, so then you know what the CARES Act, you know about the temporary rule, and then we go to this, this idea by Anthony Fauci and others that we should all have a certificate of immunity which requires a national database of those who are immune and those who aren't. An interesting thing I just learned about immunity. So this is constitutional questions, obviously Fourth Amendment questions uh, and First Amendment because they, the plan would be that you couldn't move, you couldn't work, you couldn't leave your house, that sort of thing if you didn't have this certificate. So these are definitely uh, constitutional concerns. Uh, but the interesting thing about immunity that I just learned is there's two types of immunity. And one of them is called cell-mediated and the other is called humoral. humoral. Uh, cell-mediated is when your white cells, uh, the T cells of your white cells, come and just attack the virus and they destroy it. And they leave nothing behind, nothing to be tested for. Um, the other one is humoral, which uses B cells. And it, uh, it leaves antibodies behind. So the first antibodies come and they attack. And then there's a second set of antibodies that come three to four weeks later, and those show that you have immunity. And so you can test for both of them, whether you're currently under attack or whether you're now immune, uh, because it's you know, more after the fact. And so even a certificate of immunity, if you have the cell-mediated immunity, if that could possibly be happening during COVID-19, you might look like you're not immune and you actually are. So just a little piece of information that I learned and just today shared in, in uh, the video series on COVID-19. Okay, and then there's also some thoughts about coronavirus surveillance database creating that. Um, it's been said that Jared Kushner in the White House wants this and it would say where all the supplies are, where all the uh, uh, infections are, it wouldn't necessarily say individual people, at least not to start with, at least that's not been mentioned. But it is this big surveillance system. Okay, there's also, of course, the cell phone location data. Uh, there are apparently 5.2 billion smartphones in the world. It's interesting, Google and Apple are working together to create this voluntary contact tracing app. Uh, news came out that 2.5 billion of the smartphones in the world could not use it because they're either too old or they're not the right type of phone or whatever. So that's just a, a little uh, data piece. Um, the Washington Post, there were two or three authors that worked together and wrote something and they said the government should create a real-time dashboard um, tracking, and tracking the uh, virus and tracking the infection and likely tracking everybody who's been tested. Uh, and is, Israel has come up with this health rating system, one to 10. And according to your status, as soon as you hit a status, according to your contacts and you know what your job is and your age and your sex, because men are affected more than women by COVID-19, um, as soon as you hit 9.5, then it would be required that you would be tested. All right, this is close to my last slide, the ratcheting effect. 
So um, Robert Higgs wrote, wrote a book back in, published back in 1987, which I haven't read the, the book, but I've, I've read a little bit about it. And um, he's been known for what's called the ratcheting effect. And what he says is that during a crisis, whatever crisis, whether it was World War I, World War II, um, any kind of a, a war, any kind of a pandemic, the government takes the opportunity, whether that's Congress or the federal government, uh, the state governments to uh, seize power during that crisis. And then once the crisis goes away, they retrench. So they retreat, but they never retreat back to the position that they were in before the crisis. And so little by little by little, the power of the government is ratcheted up uh, into growing the government into a, an increasingly sizable power against uh, the individuals, whether that's by surveillance or control of movement or anything having to do you know, with our Bill of Rights or the constitutional um, limits that are put on federal government. Uh, the states certainly have a lot more power and President Trump has been talking about that because really under the Constitution, it's much more limited what the federal government can do, but the states have all sorts of authoritarian power that they can impose um, differently than the federal government. So let's see. Next one. Okay, so this is just a plug for my book, which has gotten um, four awards. It is up for two more. I'm waiting. Uh, they'll be announced, or or I'll, I'll f find out. I don't get it. Um, April 27th for one of them, and um, May 11th for another one. So uh, this book really, um, I've had such good comments from people, even. Uh, physicians who are using electronic health records, things that they didn't know. Uh, the second, the, uh, sorry, the fourth section of it is all about HIPAA. It has diagrams in that show what kind of data sharing there was before HIPAA and what kind of data sharing there was after HIPAA. It lists all the 2.2 million entities. Um, and at the very back of the book are suggestions specific to Congress, the state legislatures, uh, physicians and other healthcare practitioners and individuals and what they can do. Um, we do also, as a nonprofit or uh, health policy organization, we have put out two additional things which I also just want to say. Uh, one of them is called the Patient Toolbox to help you uh, deal with coercion in the exam room, particularly coercion with consent forms or testing um, or with your children. Uh, it also has 12 questions you can ask, including one of the ones that I think is the most important, important is to ask your doctor when they suggest a treatment to say, okay, Dr. X, is this the best treatment for me according to what you know? Or is this the only treatment that the electronic health record lets you choose for me? Because this is where the electronic health record is taking medicine. It's, it's moving to protocol medicine. Uh, algorithm medicine and doctors this is one of the reasons that half the physicians in this country are contemplating leaving the practice of medicine according to a study of 17,200 physicians uh, because they're no longer able to use their brains other people are telling them how to practice and they don't feel ethically like what they're doing to the patients is a good thing and so I do talk about that in the book I have those statistics in the book I talk about privacy and privacy surveys as well in the book. And, um, and the other thing that we have is uh, the Wedge of Health Freedom at jointhewedge.com. Patient Toolbox is at patienttoolbox.org. But jointhewedge.com is uh, pract practices, uh, physicians and other practices who do only cash, check, or charge. And this is the way we believe uh, the practice of medicine should go. No third-party payers, no third-party intrusions. Uh, people can have insurance, but when it comes to paying their doctor, they pay their doctor cash at a reasonable cash-based price and something that um, the patient is willing to pay. And so we're excited. There's, um, we're coming up to 450 practices uh, across the nation. Some states don't have them, other states do, other states have them, but they just aren't on the wedge. They're direct pay practices that haven't yet found out about the wedge, or they have so many patients they don't want anybody else to find them. Um, so that's all I have to say. Uh, I will um, end by just reminding you that you can go to cchfreedom.org. You can sign up for a newsletter there. You can go to our Facebook page where I'm doing these videos. 
which is CCH Freedom, which are on Facebook, CCH Freedom. And again, have done just my ninth one uh, just about two hours ago. So now I would be perfectly happy to stand for questions. And I don't know how to do that. So Sean or somebody's going to have to come in and help me out with that. Hmm. Is there a moderator here? Well, let me look at the public chat in case there's something here that will tell me something. Uh, hello, Carla. I have one question. Okay. Sorry. The noise is. You talked about uh, doctors that will accept uh, cash only, all right? It sounds like they're very. Cash check uh, and charge. Yeah, Kish. Uh, can you say, like, what do they think about this whole idea of Medicare for all, like we have here in Canada? So I would say that they would disagree with Medicare for all. Because they are cash, what they have done is they have left Medicare. Because what Medicare has, uh, has caused is this entire um, flurry of bureaucracy and controls, and they have to report uh, their compliance with how the government wants them to practice medicine and what they really want to do is to be able to work with their patients to do what they think is best for their patients and not having the government tell them what they can do. They also don't want to be rationers. And so I, you know, I don't know, you know, what you know about even um, the Affordable Care Act has something called an accountable care organization and which is called, has been called HMOs on steroids. I do write about that in my book as well. And um, it really does require, it gives the doctors and the hospitals a certain amount of money. Um, that's where it's ultimately going to. And then they would have to decide who to ration care to and who not. And, you know, so there's just a lot of concern about the ethics and the integrity of the patient-doctor relationship when the doctor can, t when the government or the government's collaborators, the health plans, can tell them how to practice medicine. Next. Sure. So, Twyla, sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself for a second, but um, we have a couple comments, I think, in the the public chat. Um, but just in general, from me, um, so obviously, you document um, sort of. Um, a number of different uh, privacy uh, erosions, right, that have come through in the past couple decades, really. Right. Um, but we're seeing an acceleration of that, I think, with this crisis. Right. Um, you mentioned the certificate of immunity um, and the database proposals and so on. How do you see that playing out from sort of a regulatory standpoint? standpoint. I know there's been these proposals by tech companies to do it, but I'm still not necessarily convinced that they're going to be able to get it through um, Congress, etc. So I think it's about, you know, not everything has to go through Congress, depending on what the powers of the uh, health officials are. And, you know, if you just want an example of how much power the Congress gives to health officials, you need look no further than the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act was 2,700 pages long, about, according to a judge who was looking at it. Um, and so, you know, just come up with however many reams of 500 pages that you want to, you know, put together to come up with 2,700. But um, I actually stood next to a stack of regulations about two years ago. And I put my, I had heels on, and I put my hand up as high as it could go. So I was probably at about seven feet. And the stack was at least a foot and a half higher than I. And so regulations, regu for if anybody has never looked at a regulation, it's like tiny font and uh, point font, and then it's three columns worth. And sometimes they come out with, you know, a thousand pages of that sort of thing. And so they have so much power. So you do not necessarily have to have this kind of thing go through Congress, uh, the certificate of need. I think 
uh, I think perhaps the, the biggest prohibition is because the president himself, when asked about that, said he thought that that would create all sorts of constitutional concerns. So, you know, people are talking about it, but that doesn't mean that it's going to get anywhere. But just the fact that people are talking about it as though it's a good thing um, just shows, you know, where some of the health officials would like to take the surveillance in this country. Um, as one more example here in the state of Minnesota, um, we, we knew about, but we'd never actually seen it in action, uh, where um, any data that comes in on an individual is considered private data on an individual. And it means that the health department can see it and the individual can see it, but nobody else can see it. But the, the commissioner of health here in her powers uh, in the health department statute versus the, the government data practices statute, in her statute, um, it says that if she chooses to, she could take that private data and make it public. And so, so we had always been concerned about this, and now we've seen it in action because as the COVID cases came up in the uh, senior uh, resident, the senior um, long-term care facilities, um, people wanted it released as to where these patients were. And she just decided to release it using that authority. So I think there's probably lots of authority that might be available for which they never have to go back to Congress to get that kind of power. The real question is whether they would then be sued or whether the president would talk so much about it that it wouldn't happen. Sure. So I, I guess the question is, and, and the question on a lot of people's minds is, um, you know, how quickly do you see this sort of um, moving forward? Um, do you think the smoke screen or at least the, the current crisis that exists, um, do you think that's going to create a smoke screen um, where um, a lot of these anti-privacy uh, measures are going to just be rushed through that have sort of been planned for a long time. Um, do you think there's going to be enough pushback that maybe we might gain a little privacy back? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think there are a fair amount of people that when they're afraid they, because they don't even understand it because most people actually think HIPAA protects them. So they have this delusion of privacy and uh, they have no idea and so they might be able they might be willing to give up uh, some privacy temporarily but to think that the government would regularly profile them which is what the government wants to do in my book i talk about the cdc looking forward to the time when they can have real-time access to the electronic health records to find data buried that's where they use buried in the electronic health record. I don't think that that would sit very well with people. The real question is whether we can um, we can get the people convinced, but the book is part of this, that they don't actually have any privacy and we can create a movement across the country to get our privacy back. Um, what can happen with this sort of thing in a pandemic is that they could create um, regulations or laws that are uh, temporary. They have a sunset date. Uh, that was the unfortunate thing about the public health surveillance and analytics infrastructure. They actually, they actually created this thing brand new to be nationwide. And now, um, under HIPAA, states do have the authority to stop the federal government's initiatives. Uh, if, like here in Minnesota, we have the strongest privacy law in the nation, and our organization has been fighting to protect it tooth and nail for the last uh, five or six years as the corporations uh, and the government and the big data industry have all, and the researchers have all wanted to get rid of it. We actually require consent in the state. We're the only one. And, um, and so, you know, this is something that states can do and people can complain about. So they could, they could create the public health infrastructure, but they could, the states could stop them from actually getting access to the data in their states. I think that privacy is going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. Um, and a lot of people have been deceived now by HIPAA, but that's part of our goal as an organization to remove to remove the myth, uh, to uh, undo the deception, and to get the American public to um, start talking about this issue in a in a major way. 
So um, we're obviously uh, meeting remotely here. Uh, a lot more people are bringing their health questions, their mental health questions um, and diagnoses online. Um, what do you think the future of that is? Um, do you think that um, there will be more regulation for that? And um, is that something that will be integrated into healthcare records or is that something that will probably remain separate? Hmm. That's a good question. The purveyors of electronic health records, even like Judith Faulkner, who's got, who's a billionaire as a result of the High Tech Act and everybody having to buy the product that she sells, um, she foresees electronic health record becoming a CHR instead of an EHR, a comprehensive health record. And um, she wants to know and says that the electronic health record should tell us um, how often we sleep, what we eat, what our social conditions are, uh, everything. Um, and they want to bring it in through the, the patient portals where people submit their own data, not understanding really how this is going into a really big system. Uh, they want to capture the data from Facebook and from different social media sites. You know, they want all of this together. And so they would certainly want everything that would happen in a telemedicine model in the electronic health record. Uh, I think the real question is whether it will be um, and what patients figure out. Now, the thing is that, that when you're a patient, you're a vulnerable person. So you need help. And you're dying, you're sick, you're injured, you're whatever. And you don't have the capacity to fight against the taking of your data, the, the taking of your information, the profiling of you. You don't have the capacity to fight, which is why this is so unethical. Uh, one of the doctors I quote in my book talks about how he gave up his practice of 3,000 patients because he couldn't tell them how their data was being used, and he didn't want to be the one that was collecting it. And so um, there are certainly ways to protect against this. There's you know, all of this um, uh, adding noise to the data or uh, encrypting it. There's all sorts of things that could be done but those who want all our data and they want it all in one place and they want all of it accessible to all of them, they're, they're not interested in that. So I think this will be a movement. Right now we're all uh, remote and there are patients who are providing things remotely, but I don't know the degree to which they're telling the whole story because they may or may not believe that what they're saying, I mean, is, is Zoom getting access to every word that they're saying, right? They, they may not, they may not know that, and um, or they may be concerned about that. And that is always something that patients will do. They will do their very best to protect themselves, uh, trying to say the least that they can say when they're scared that the confidentiality doesn't really exist in the exam room. Sure, and I, I think HIPAA is a very low bar, as, as you've pointed out. So um, a lot of these apps. I think it's a bar. It's not even a bar. <laughs> Fair enough. Unless you're coming up to the bar to get somebody's data, then it's a very big bar for those who are allowed access to it. They can sip on it all they want. <laughs> so we have a question in the, the public chat here, um, just kind of a general question, you know, um, for privacy movements, um, how um, can we sort of amplify um, your message, other privacy advocates? How can we provide sort of a shared platform for this message? Um, there's so much going on. Uh, does privacy get lost? Um, and are there sort of opportunities here to do what we're doing here and do it bigger? Hmm. Well, certainly we, uh, because this is one of the greatest deceptions ever, um, uh, we certainly do encourage people to use their own platforms to tell the truth about HIPAA. I, I just can't even tell you how many people think HIPAA protects privacy when it does the exact opposite. It opens up the medical record. So everybody needs to talk about this on their own platform. We have several projects, like one is refusing to sign the HIPAA form. And then we have a... Um, uh, um, a button on our website where you can share your HIPAA story because some people who refuse to sign the HIPAA form are denied access to care even though the federal government says that can't happen. Uh, they can't do that, but they are doing that. Um, I, shall, I, I need to say here that whether you sign the HIPAA form or you don't sign the HIPAA form, they can still share your information, but you are educating the clinic 
uh, by letting them know that you understand that HIPAA doesn't protect your privacy at all. And if you look at the Notice of Privacy Practices, which should be called a Notice of Disclosure Practices, you will see that you have no privacy under HIPAA. So this is, um, so you know, we're, we're, the book is par partially about that. Uh, in every presentation that I give, I talk about how HIPAA does not protect privacy. Um, we have this entire campaign to get people to stop signing the HIPAA form. And, uh, and we've got more, that we got more. Is this, we say he who holds the data makes the rules. So every, every um, dictator, every uh, society that is run by a tyrant understands that surveillance is the way that you control people. I look at the electronic health record as the plan for that is to become a complete dossier on every member of the American public with all of these 2.2 million entities plus government having access to the data to do what they want with it. Uh, providing those who hold it decide to share it, which they do all the time. And um, and Amazon, just as another little factoid, Amazon has received the medical records of the two, of 250 million people uh, because Cerner, the electronic health record company, has a contract with Amazon. So we, we will get to a point here, I think, where there will be a revolt. But right now, everybody who wants our data is sitting pretty pretty. Sitting pretty pretty, is that right? <laughs> They're sitting pretty well under the, um, under the delusion and the, the, the hoax that HIPAA is uh, privacy protecting. Sure. Um, so yeah, you're right to put it in the, the sort of framework of compelled disclosure. That's 100% that's correct. Um, so Thank you so much. Um, we've got uh, great discussions going on here still, but uh, this was a great way to cap off the first day. And um, is there anything else you want to sort of plug or, or just send people to uh, before we call it a day here? No, I think, you know, if you share the book or just let people know that the book exists, it really tells the story. And doctors have said they didn't even realize everything that was going on, physicians. Um, and I, I've just got, I've got legislators who have had it who have said it's like the best history ever of, of privacy and electronic health records. And so I just encourage you to get it, to read it.